So without any further ado, uh, let's have a listen to David Schutz. I'm, I'm being brave today, and I'm, I'm just going to move this just a little bit forward there, Andrew. I hope yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I'm being brave today. I'm not using PowerPoint, <laughs> but I do have a stack of notes here in front of me. And this started off as a fairly short talk, and then my notes just grew uh, as I was putting stuff down. So, first of all, in terms of format, in terms of questions and answers, if you have a question, whack the hand up or say, hold on, young fella, <laughs> and stop me in my tracks and, and ask for clarification then. Because the, uh, the toing and froing is a lot better than uh, me talking um, for half an hour and then you thinking, gosh, there was a question I had 20 minutes ago, but I can't remember what it is now. Okay, so I did work for almost 20 years for the Archdiocese in an official capacity, not just in ecumenism, but in interfaith relations. And the difference there is, one is working with other Christians, and the other is working with, as I basically said to people, um, if you're not Christian and you're not an atheist, I wanted to know you. <laughs> so it, all the other, it's calling them faiths, religious ideas, whatever, I work with those communities as well. Today I'm just going to talk about ecumenism, and it's important, another distinction between interfaith and ecumenical work is for interfaith work, you, the aim is to get along with one another and stop shooting each other. Um, for uh, ecumenical work, the stated aim of the Catholic Church in being involved in ecumenism with, non, with our non-Catholic brothers and sisters is full communion. The aim of trying to re-establish um, the situation in which all baptised Christians can gather around the same Eucharistic altar to receive our Lord in the sacrament. That, uh, in many ways, I said to somebody once, I think sometimes the Catholic Church is the only church, only church involved in communion, ecumenism, that actually still holds that out as the goal of ecumenical interaction and efforts. So I'm going to start off by telling a little story first about a part of my PhD that I'm doing at the moment, which has got nothing to do, I thought, with ecumenism. I'm working on the relationship and the theology of Joseph Ratzinger, who we all know and love, who's gone to God now, Benedict the Sixteenth, and Karl Rahner, another, some people would probably say, the greatest or most influential theologian of the 20th century. There are a lot of eminent theologians in the Catholic Church in the 20th century. Another one was Hans Urs from Balthasar. And all these guys knew each other. They all spoke German and they all went to the Second Vatican Council together. Well, Balthazar didn't, but anyway. Uh, and after the council, things blew up a little bit in the Catholic Church. You, you've heard, you know this? <laughs> there were changes. And these changes were a bit disturbing to um, uh, Herr Balthazar. And he got his mate Herr Ratzinger, Professor Ratzinger, together, and together they wrote let a letter off to their other mate. Well, they had some problems with him, and he had some problems with them, but they wrote to him anyway, Professor Rana. And while I was in Germany last October, I discovered the letters these guys had written to each other. And I've just sent off an article for publication, and I'm giving a paper on it at the Australian Catholic Theological Association Conference next Friday. So this is hot off the press stuff. These guys were writing to each other because they were disturbed at the breakdown in the unity of Catholic theology that began to happen very quickly and almost immediately after the Second Vatican Council. There was divisions and differences of opinion beforehand, but afterwards things just went bat crazy, as somebody might say. And by 1968, just three years after the Council, the year of uh, Humane um, 
Vita. Yes, Vita. The uh, encyclical on the pill. Everything was going in all directions. And these three guys and a few others, leading theologians, thought they were trying to bring the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church's theologians back around the unity of the creed, and around some unity. They failed. Their project came to nothing. And things just went on and on from there. But you can't say they weren't aware of it. You can't say they didn't try. Rana himself wrote an um, essay soon after, about six months later, and the title was Plurality in Theology and the Unity of the Creed in the Church. And in that essay, he basically, he had, there's a, there was a little line that just struck me, I read it the other day, the alien is close to us. That which is different from us is now close to us. And I want to come back to that. And I want to come back soon to this question of unity within our own church, let alone outside of it. But let me just tell you a quick, give you a quick rundown about what happened, what ecumenism, how that came to be, why it became a thing. And I think you have to say it was a 20th century phenomenon. And I mean that when I say a 20th century phenomenon because it's not a 21st century phenomenon. And it wasn't a 19th century one, it was a 20th century one. In 1910, the World Missionary Conference, which was all Protestants, uh, no Catholics, no Orthodox involved, was held in Edinburgh in Scotland. The year of the 19th century, along with the colonial settlements of many parts of the world, was also the great year of missions. So you had missions to Africa and missions to Asia and all the rest of it. But you had the Presbyterians doing it and the Anglicans doing it and the Maptocostal Anglaholics doing it. And they had, would all turn up at this little village and there would be three people or four people preaching away and saying, come to my church. And the other one would say, no, come to mine. And after a while they scratched their heads and said, well, this is a bit of a scandal, isn't it? What are the people going to think if you come with the word of Jesus and you come with the word of Jesus and he comes with the word of Jesus and we're all saying different things and we're all saying, come to this table for communion. Come to this place over here for, for mass and that sort of stuff. So they held a conference where they tried to overcome, to make start a movement which was, became, came to be called the ecumenical movement from the Greek word oikos, for a house, it comes from the same word economic comes from, which is the business of the house. This is how to keep the family together. The ecumenical movement got a kick off in 1910, and it was for these two reasons. One was because of evangelism, and the other was to overcome the scandal of disunity. Disunity was a scandal for the gospel. Well, then we had a couple of wars. And after the Second World War, when the United Nations was being formed, so also something called the World Council of Churches was formed. If you can have a United Nations, maybe you can have a United Churches. And they managed to get the Orthodox involved in that, so it's Protestants and Orthodox. And then a few years later, we've got the Second Vatican Council, and you've got John XXIII saying that he wanted to make the unity of the Church a central focus of the council. And for the first time, separated brethren and sisters were invited to come <coughs> to an ecumenical council and to be involved, be involved as observers. One very significant thing that happened at the end of the council, and the council promulgated a document on ecumenism, and the Catholic Church committed itself to the ecumenical movement. The Catholic Church has never joined the World Council of Churches, but it does have official involvement with the Council and works closely together with the Council. But one of the steps forward, and I guess it got everybody's hopes up, was that at the end of the Council, the thousand or nine hundred year long excommunication between Constantinople and Rome was removed. Both the uh, uh, Bishop of Constantinople and the Bishop of Rome together relinquished the excommunication. 
didn't mean that there was then full union between the East and the West. It was the start of a conversation, not the end of it. Other things that happened, these conversations then got going. And so from the late 1960s right through up into the present, churches got involved in things we call bilateral dialogues. Bilateral, by for two. So you would get the Catholics talking to the Lutherans and the Catholics talking to the Uniting Church or the Methodists as they were back in those days. Or you'd get the Anglicans talking to the Lutherans and the Anglicans talking to the Baptists. And, but it was always two groups would come together, they would sit around the table, they would have a topic and they'd say, well, we think this about the Mass. And what do you think about your Lord's Supper? And can we come to some points of agreement on that? And this was fairly successful. Long books were written, um, agreements that were made. You had with the Anglicans especially, we had a group called ARCIC, the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission. That went through three or four different incarnations. And came up with a lot of agreed statements. One of the most successful worldwide was the Lutheran Catholic Dialogue. Not just worldwide, but even locally. Partly, if I may say this about my church-in-law, my wife is still Lutheran. Uh, Father Tony knows her well because she's down here at St. Paul's at Box Hill. Um, they, Lutherans love a good doctrinal discussion. <laughs> And most Catholic theologians did too, so they were able to get together and make lots of lovely uh, joint agreements. But of course there was another Lutheran organized, uh, group of theologians off talking with the Uniting Church. And they were coming up with a different set of agreements there. This is the problem with bilateral dialogues. And to be honest, no unity between the churches came out of any of that. Understanding did, but not full communion in any situation. Um, one, another way of doing it, and uh, just, to, just to say that it wasn't all about bilateral dialogues, the relations with the Eastern churches was usually done bishop to bishop. So, very famously, the Pope of the Coptic Church in Egypt was able to talk to Pope John Paul II and the two of them together were able to overcome a Christological, this is a doctrine of Jesus, uh, controversy which was 1500 years old. And they were able to issue a joint statement on that. Basically it meant a bit of peddling back on the uh, Copts side of things. I'll come back to the cops in a minute. Um, famously, they always wanted to meet with the Russian Orthodox, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, I forget what the top man's job is, uh, name is, the Archbishop of Moscow. Patriarch. Patriarch, thank you, thank you for that. Um, only ever happened with, just recently, uh, about five or six years ago, with um, Pope Francis and the Patriarch. But of course things have gone a bit belly up there, I'll come back to them as well. Uh, but then you see, already by the 1980s, so there was a lot of excitement, people thought things were happening. But then by the early 1980s, or the late 1980s, people began talking about a winter of ecumenism. It seemed all these talks weren't going anywhere. People were used to things moving really quickly and they weren't. Um, a high point was reached in 1999 with something called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification between the Vatican Office for uh, Ecumenical Relations and the Lutheran World Federation. They basically came to an agreement, those two bodies, one basically the Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation that the whole stuff about justification by faith alone at the time of the Reformation was a misunderstanding. And basically, as we understand it today, we do not uh, condemn each other's doctrines on the way by which justification takes place. Now, you would have thought 
that this being the whole reason why the Lutheran Church is a separate organisation from the Catholic Church, this would have opened the door to full communion. No. In fact, I was still in the Lutheran Church there at the time and I asked the question on a, at one of our pastors' conferences and I, I won't say I was laughed off the floor, but it, you know, it came close. There was no interest whatsoever in pursuing this in terms of what does this mean for full communion. Now that's just my one personal experience here, but it is indicative of what has happened to the ecumenical movement as such. Individual groups are these days not really interested in... No, actually, I, I'm going to wind back a bit further before I go any further, because another thing that happened in the 1990s was John Paul II issued an encyclical called Ut Unum Sint, so if it wasn't the doctrine of justification that was the problem, keeping the Protestants apart, maybe it was the papacy. Maybe that was the problem of the Bishop of Rome and all his claims to infallibility and um, universal jurisdiction and all of that sort of stuff. So Pope John Paul II wrote an encyclical saying, Dear Protestant brothers and sisters, dear Orthodox brothers and sisters, write to us and tell us how you think we could exercise the ministry of the Bishop of Rome in a way without relinquishing anything which is of its essence would actually be of service to you and would help the unity of, church, of the church. <laughs> Crickets. In uh, 2012, when Pope Fra Francis released the <laughs> Gaudium, he says there'd been almost no movement on this. Now, interestingly, just lately there has been a little bit of movement, but largely because the Pontifical Council, or whatever they call it now, um, the um, Commission for Ecumenism in the Vatican, has worked hard at collecting what has been said about uh, the place of the papacy in ecumenical relations, uh, and they have just issued a big study document on that. Um, but it was hard work getting something together. Uh, basically, we found out that, no, the papacy isn't a big problem either. Again, it's simply the question, where is the will for communion together as churches, when we're really, in many ways, continuing on our own paths? And this way it raises up a much, much <coughs> bigger problem. Um, a whole lot of new issues have come up since the Reformation. And these issues can be things like wars. The ecumenical situation in the Ukraine has been very interestingly affected by Russian military uh, um, action in that country. Uh, there used to be an Orthodox Church in the Ukraine that was in full communion with the Russian Orthodox Church. Well, that's come to an end. And actually, probably the Russians have, uh, military, uh, the war there has done the best for ecumenical relations in the Ukraine ever since. So, um, you know, the Ukrainian Catholic Church and the other three or four Orthodox churches there are getting along just fine at the moment, thanks to having a common enemy. <laughs> I'll get to talking about the ecumenism of the trenches later on. Um, but also then things come up, and we've had a really great relationship going with the Coptic Church, until just six months ago, we get a statement from the Vatican uh, fiducia supplicants, with its own suggestion about blessing uh, um, same-sex couples and well the cops are having nothing on that and instantly it's broken off and it's not going anywhere in the meantime let's go back to what I was talking about with Rana saying the alien is close to us one of the things that has happened in our society how am I going for time? I'm about halfway through because I had some problem getting here. One of the things that has happened in our society is that there has been... We once used to live in a society where everything 
we could expect our neighbours to think the way we did. We could expect the ch our children to think the way we did. We could go to Christmas dinner and we would all more or less agree on the things. Oh, well, the things we disagreed on were pretty minor compared to today. Today you could go along to Christmas dinner and you could have your daughter has brought her Jewish uh, boyfriend along, so out goes the ham. Um, your, um, you've got um, your nephew and his same-sex partner has come along. Um, you've got people not just of different, you've got the atheists amongst them, those who aren't practicing their faith, used to practice faith or don't anymore. You've got people of all different ideas sitting around <coughs> your table. The alien is close to you. The other has come home. They're not over there, they're right here with us. And that's the same in our churches. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of different opinions and ideas, just as there were for Hans Ertum, Balthasar, and Joseph Ratzinger and Karl Rana 50 years ago. It's even more now that in any of our parishes, if you were to ask, put out a theological questionnaire before everybody went to communion, no one would be going to communion together. Because you cannot be... It's just the reality that these days we all believe in our own way. Now there was a philosopher called Charles Taylor, his Catholic is in Canada, and he called this the supernova of pluralism. Or the supernova of individual authenticity. Each of us has to be true now to the truth that I see. And it's an ecumenical endeavour for me every time I go to church on Sunday. And just holding together, and anybody who has a job, say, Vicar General or something, um, <laughs> who has to hold together some sort of unity in a geographical area that embraces, what are we up to, one and a half million Catholics? About that? That's a big job. Um, and so when, you, when we prepare for a, a Senate or a Council and we send out a questionnaire saying, tell us what you think, and they get all the responses back, and there's no way they can unify those, all those ideas. Now, it's not just the Catholic Church. As you know, the Anglicans are struggling with unity worldwide. Mm. My local Lutheran church at the moment is, um, can I say going to hell in a handbasket? <laughs> um, <laughs> unfortunately, they've um, sold their, uh, their seminary just recently. They're tearing each other apart mm. over the issue of the ordination of women, which is now, they have had six different votes at six different synods on this and never got the magic 67% for it, and so whatever the future is going at the moment, they haven't got time to be involved in ecumenical endeavours with the Catholic Church or to look at full communion with the Catholic Church, because they're trying to keep full communion together themselves, and that's a full-time job for their, um, their leadership. Let's, or let's just look at just one single thing, the one single thing which up to recently has been the thing which is now redrawing the shape and the relationships of churches all over the world. The question of the ordination of for Eucharistic ministry of women. This drives right down the line of absolutely every single Christian communion, including our own. <coughs> and it is, it is redrawing the map. So there's that Anglican church that does ordain women, it says that Anglican church that doesn't. There's two kinds of Lutherans in the world, those who do and those who don't. Uh, the Orthodox Church, there are people within the Orthodox Church who are wanting to move down that line as well. And you'll get the Orthodox churches who do and the Orthodox churches who don't. How that's going to affect us in the future is a big question. And an even bigger question are the moral issues. We struggled hard back under Archbishop Dennis to get an interfaith 
and ecumenical statements, so two separate statements, one from the Christians and one from the different religious groups, on euthanasia when it was being introduced by our government. You have no idea how hard it was to get any kind of unified statement on that issue. So once upon a time we all lived in fairly solid tribal groups where I could say this is the Catholic doctrine and the Lutheran I was in dialogue with could say and this is the Lutheran doctrine and you could get together for your bilateral conversation and you could come to some agreement on that. But now when you've got five different Catholic views and 55 different Lutheran views, how is that possible? How do we do that? Do you know, for the first time, oh, by the way, this isn't, this isn't just the church, this is our society. So the social tribes have broken down. <coughs> We've got such a degree of pluralism at the moment. The, ni 2000, uh, the 1910 missionary conference met together because disunity was a scandal. Today, we celebrate diversity. <laughs> it's something we're meant to celebrate. How do we hold together, as Karl Rahner put in his title of his essay, the plurality of our theologies with the unity of the creed? What are we to do there? The alien is close to us, sitting next to me in the pew. So, let's think about this a bit more. One of the first divisions that ever happened in the church's history, over which separated churches, say the Coptic church from the Catholic church, was arguments over who Jesus Christ is. That was about 1,500 years ago. 500 years ago we were arguing about justification. Today, some theologians are saying the divisive issue today is what is a human being? So not the question who is Jesus, 1,500 years ago, how are we saved? 500 years ago. Today, what is man that thou art so mindful of? What is a human being? And this raises all the questions of gender, all the questions of marriage, all the moral questions which come into view as well. And these are not just issues of church formation, these are issues of sacraments, these are issues of morality, they're questions of tradition, they're questions of how you read scripture, and it's absolutely not something that disagreement will come along the lines that you can say, well, Anglicans believe this, Lutherans believe that, and Catholics believe that. So we need to get back to some basics, and I'll get around to winding it up now. What is unity based on, and what has it always been based on? Unity amongst Christians is based on our baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our baptism into Christ. That's the unity, that's the basis we have for even talking about communion with one another. That's why I don't talk about communion with the Jews or with the Muslims or with the um, Sikhs. I've got to have that basis before I can begin that talk. That's why we're brothers, that's why we call each other brother here. Because you are all baptised as brothers into that oikos, that household, which is the ecumenical household. So the task of ecumenism is to deepen that communion which we already have. It's a real but not yet communion in many ways. And whether that person, whether our brother in Christ calls himself a Lutheran or an Anglican or a Methodist, they are our brothers still, in the same way as my brother who calls himself a Catholic. And just the same way I've got to work at my communion with you, who I call my brother Catholic, I need to work at the communion with my brother Lutheran, my brother Anglican, my brother uh, Maptocostal Angloholic, or whatever they are. And the way we do that is by encouraging one another more and more and more in our faithfulness to Jesus Christ. <coughs> in other words, our faithfulness to our baptism. The more and more we encourage one another in our vocation, our baptismal vocation, the more will our unity with one another be deepened. 
I once was in a church giving this sort of talk, and um, I was in a uniting church, and there was a big cross at the front. And I said, so, okay, and there weren't as many of you, uh, there was about half a dozen people in the church, and they were sitting all <coughs> over the different place in the church. And I said, we're all sitting and we're looking at the cross. That's Jesus. And if you head towards Jesus, and if you over there head towards Jesus, and you there head towards Jesus, that is the point in the future at which we will meet. So I want to leave you with some ideas. I know you're supposed to be having this as a part of your theme um, at the moment, to think about, to deepen in. First of all, then, I want to encourage you in solidarity with your Christian neighbour. That might be the ecumenism of the back fence, you know, or the communion, or of the garage or of the pub. But it also might be the communion of the workplace, where we need, in this, in this world today, where there's fewer and fewer of us as salt and as yeast in the community, we need to be encouraging one another in our Christian faith. And that, you do not have to both be able to go to the same altar for the sacrament to be able to encourage one another since you've all come from the same font. The second thing I would, oh, by the way, um, I'll just make a note that that's happening in very real sense in our rural communities, especially in Victoria, where there aren't <coughs> priests or ministers for every denomination every Sunday. And, and even Catholics, the closest mass might be 100 kilometres away. And so there are things happening just on the ground where they decide, well, we better do stuff together. Um, I think there's also a, a real case for moral ecumenism in our society today, that we will find that we need to stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters in Christ, who share the same moral convictions that we do in our society today, our same ethical um, convictions. And that doesn't always mean being an activist for this or, you know, marching and shouting, but it does mean being a bit of a rock, a bit of a pillar, a bit of a shoulder to lean on um, at times with one another. Um, and that's interesting because the early church, communion was often broken even if you go to in the, the scriptures, you get cases in Acts where, or in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians where communion was broken because of moral uh, misdemeanours rather than theological reasons. Finally, there is what John Paul II called in his encyclical of Unum Sint spiritual communion. And this is the communion of prayer. One thing we can still do as Christians is pray the Lord's Prayer together. We can pray for one another. We can pray with one another. We can, within that and out of that, have a shared witness and a shared mission. That nice, you do stuff. You can do stuff with people, with other groups, uh, both the Anglicans and the Lutherans um, have groups just like you guys, and you can do stuff together for your communities. That you can share that mission, you can share that witness, but find ways that you can share prayer together. So, solidarity with your neighbour, your Christian neighbour, a kind of moral ecumenism for the sake of our society, and a spiritual ecumenism. You don't need. The Vicar General's blessing for this, <laughs> just, or the Archbishops, you can just do it in your own idiom, in your own way and in your own place. And that's very small, but this is this whole business about the mustard seed, about the salt, about the yeast. And you can't see what the future is going to be, but remember we're heading for Christ. Thank you.
recent National Council of Churches ah. had, a, had a seminar. I think they've been going quite eighteen churches about thirty years or something. Can you tell us a little bit about that organisation? Oh well, the National Council of Churches in Australia um, did a complete rethink back in the mid nineties. I think they completely reconstituted themselves um, because they uh, were for a long time just a Protestant group, but then they needed to open up. The, the Lutheran Church wasn't even a member, and they, they did a new constitution as how they would come together. There is a kind of ecumenism in the world. I mentioned the World Council of Churches. That's a universal body. The World Council of Churches relates to national councils. <coughs> on a more local level, there are state in Australia there are state councils of churches. So we have the Victorian Council of Churches here. Um, I was until I recently turned up at an AGM to find I wasn't a representative anymore. I was representative for the uh, Archdiocese on that for about 20 years, uh, and the Lutheran Church before that. Um, and then there used to be, but this is what I sort of mean by things changing a bit and interest losing. There used to be local councils of churches as well. Is there a local, is there a sort of White Horse churches together? There is, isn't there? And you do all kinds of good things like um, feeding the hungry and stuff. We focus on that, but we also focus on praying together. Right. We have two weeks of prayer uh, in May and October uh, where we share and go to each other's places for prayer. Um, that spiritual humanism. And the emphasis is not to do what we think the others would like, but to do what we do best and share it with them. Right, so this is a good spot for putting the National Council of Churches in their place. It tends to work a bit hierarchically up the ladder. I think some of the best work is done locally where local councils are still happening or rural, as I mentioned, the rural situation as well. Once you get to the National Council of Churches, you've basically got people participating there who are representatives on an institutional basis for their, in fact, that's what the Victorian Council of Churches is now as well. Um, and so they become places, meeting points for not bilateral, but multilateral. Now, it's not even dialogue anymore. It's more of a question of what can we do together? What can we say together? And I think that's becoming a fairly narrow possibility. Um, I've only ever attended one National Council of Churches uh, Australia meeting, and it's not big. It's more, less, fewer people that are in this room when they get together, but they are, they have a, an official capacity to speak to one another on behalf of their own churches. Do, um, is there something you wanted to ask about their activities or? I uh, think uh, the Catholic Church is part of that. Yes. yes, so the Catholic Church is a part of all the state and local and national council here in Australia. It's the Catholic Church universally is not a part of the World Council of Churches. Did anyone else have any questions to ask? Uh, John? <clears throat> David, uh, as a person who's grown up whilst all this has been happening from my childhood to now, um, I really haven't heard much about what you've been speaking about today. Um, do you see that as a problem in society where generations haven't been brought up to date about what's happening? Uh, Pope Francis said something recently, and I think Archbishop Peter has talked about this occasionally, about um, we're not living through an era of change so much as a change of era. And this is why I mentioned the philosopher Charles Taylor, because one of the things we do have to understand is entire thought patterns have changed. And I can say the year 1968, the very year my friends Balthazar and Ratzinger and Rana were writing to one another saying, what are we doing about this mess that's coming up? A lot of people have blamed the Second Vatican Council for changes. Uh, it was just the timing of when that council happened because the whole of society was moved. You've got things like the Vietnam War going on. You've got um, a whole lot of ideas that were just held by elites once and they finally got down to the grassroots and then you've got the hippie movement, 
You had postmodernism beginning at that point as well. So, so basically, the way people are thinking, the value of the rest, has gone through a massive change. And we do need to pay a bit of attention to sociologists and understand and try and learn about that change because we are not in Daniel Mannix's era anymore. You know, there isn't a single tribe called the Irish Catholics that a guy can come marching across from the other side of the world and he became, can become their king and their prince and fight all their battles for them. And when he says jump, they all jump. That's the old, that's what um, Taylor calls the age of mobilisation, when a leader could just mobilise his mob to all act in lockstep. Nobody acts in lockstep anymore. But that's even in a national level. We can't, as Australians, decide among ourselves what it means to be Australian. And to even ask that question is an almost senseless question other than to say we live in Australia. Because there are, how many of us now? 26 million? 27? 26. There's 27 million ways to be in Australia. Mm. And that's the world we live in at the moment. Yeah. Uh, David, uh, what effect did mass communication uh, have? Because was, from my understanding, wasn't the Second Vatican Council called specifically to deal with how to uh, uh, evangelise the faith in the era of mass communication? I don't know if it was put in those terms, but they were aware of it because they certainly mm. issued a document on mass communication at the time. Mm. Um, now, mass communication means radio, newspaper and the new technology of television. Telev television, and then yep. if you extend that out to today, internet, etc. Yep. Obviously, you know, you had that era prior, up to World War II where we were only just getting into that yes. phase. So, okay. but that it's, it, it's, it's, it's enormous. And it has changed the way our church and all the churches have. There's been a bigger change since. The, the guy I was referring to, Charles Taylor, who's still living, he's in his late 90s, I talked to him um, last year on Zoom, um, he wrote his big book about the massive change in 1968, in the late 60s. He wrote that in 2007. Do you know what else happened in 2007? Twitter. Well, before that, these things were invented. The iPhone. The first iPhone mm. came out in 2007. Yeah. The smartphones gave birth to social media. Mm. And there's a new book out, I haven't read it all yet, by a guy called Jonathan Haidt called The Anxiety Generation, because he links these things to the mental health pandemic mm. that your grandchildren are all dealing with. Mm. Um, you've all got grandchildren with mental health issues, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> or if you have grandchildren, you no. do. <laughs> no. Anyway, it's, um, so big changes. Mm. And especially the way our church operates now, God, God help anybody in the leadership of our church because any noise they make will be reported on social media yeah. and misreported tomorrow morning. Yeah. And everybody will throw in their 10 cents worth. Yeah. Um, this is a different way of being church. What does the papacy mean in an age of, of social communication? What does it mean for us to be talking to Protestant churches about the exercise of the papacy when we're having a, an S fight <laughs> online about our current papacy? This is something we need to think about a little bit more. The world is a different place. I remember when Pope Benedict first, I don't remember doing this with John Paul II, but I had a little MP3 player when Pope Benedict became Pope. And every week I would download his, um, his weekly audience to listen to him. And I thought how wonderful it was I could hear the voice of the Pope. Now we just sometimes wish he'd be quiet for a bit. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, changes everything. Yeah. John. Hey, I'm wondering, are there any churches around the world, non-Catholic churches, who you see hope for um, rejoining and Okay, well, the big, you know, the big story on this, of course, was what Pope Benedict did with the Anglican churches, where he offered a way forward. He actually put in place, see, part of the problem is we don't have a roadmap for reunion. And Pope Benedict knew that there were a lot of Catholic, uh, Anglicans around 
who were dissatisfied, especially with the dissatisfaction that came up because of the ordination of women issue, and more to the point, the ordination of women to bishops was the big issue, because once you've got a bishop who you can't live under, who's ordaining other priests, and that causes issues of communion. So he put in place a roadmap by which um, Anglicanorum Chaitibus, groups of Anglicans, could move into full communion of the Catholic Church together and retain their, Catholic, their Anglican identity. And we call this the Anglican Ordinary. Now, uh, it's been more successful in some places than other places, but I wouldn't say it's been a roaring success. Um, it's offered a way for some people, but it hasn't sort of said, okay, this is the roadmap for future reunion. But that is a case where it did happen, but boy, it was hard on our end to sort out the canon law involved. Just a nightmare, I imagine. <laughs> the difficulty was they had uh, a proportion of pastors to parishioners oh, yes. that was uh, almost <laughs> impossible to sustain. Yeah, yeah. A whole lot of priests converting. See, when I converted and I, went, I, I came back to being a lay person, when, for some reason, I haven't sorted it out yet because there's no rhyme or reason for it, Catholics seem to think Anglicans are more priests than Lutherans are. And there's no, and there's no truth to that whatsoever. Um, we, I was as much a priest as any Anglican priest is. Um, which is why we had to reordain them, of course. But it was a case of look like a duck, talk like a duck, and walk like a duck, so it must be a duck, I think. <laughs> Uh, they didn't call us priests, we were called pastors, you know, the job was the same, I wore the same outfit, but it doesn't seem to work. So anyway, I'm not getting off, my, off the track. Um, yeah, it's, there, there are difficulties there. We, I think in England it's still going quite well, they just got a new bishop ordained, their first um, actual bishop for their ordinary, and he was an Anglican priest as well. So that looks like that will get some solidarity, some good, some regular basis. And that might go forwards. I don't know how the states are going with their ordinary, but anyway, yeah. it's moving along. It is. Uh, yeah. <coughs> it struggles because of the they're the priest people think. Yeah, clergy yes. tend to um, convert a lot more than lay people do because we're immersed in it all the time, and the issues. Are big. Yeah, you want to get a priest or a person becoming a priest. Yes, but what happens with the flock? Do they come along? Well, you see, that's what. Anglican Norum Chaitibus was organised for, where um, the, the parish had an identity and a shared identity which they wished to make that move. Um, probably in Anglican churches, because they could call their own, uh, sometimes arrange for their own priests to come that suited their character, sometimes in the Protestant churches the congregation develops a character separate and I, uh, uh, from the question of what kind of priest they have. So they will get a priest to suit their character or charism, whereas we in the Catholic Church don't get a charge for that because <laughs> we get whoever the bishop sends us and then the parish changes overnight because we've got a different priest and everyone goes off to the neighbouring parish yeah. because they don't like this priest. That's, that's why this idea of missions didn't work because we all the... All the parishes are already divided into separate groups. You know, that's the, there's an old Jewish joke. Um, two Jews were rescued on a desert island. They'd been shipwrecked. And when the boat came to rescue them, there were four grass huts on the beach. This was told to me by a Jew, so I can tell them. <laughs> and, and, and they said, well, what are these four grass <coughs> huts? And one well, of the guys said, well, that's my synagogue, and that's his synagogue. And that's the synagogue we used to go to, and that's the synagogue we never go to. <laughs> I think that sums it up. Uh, just one more, one more question from the front, Brian. Who's going? Oh, who, who's going? Brian. Right. All right. Going back to where the, the change is going to have influence, and that's the school level. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Daughter's a principal of two schools, and of course you have the issue of baptism and the requirement of you know, baptism. It's accepted as baptism in any in other place. How do you 
you see that being played out, you know, as a requirement within, you know, the candidacy for school, schools advertise a lot now and they yeah, make yeah, points. Yeah. Those who are good at it doing pretty well. Uh, I can't. I don't have a lot of under, uh, knowledge of the Catholic school system, but I. But the Lutheran Church has a school system which, if it was per capita, it would be bigger than the Catholic school system simply because of the numbers involved. Yeah. So there's something. I think the important thing is, and the Catholic Church needs to decide this, and we need to decide this about our schools. Are our schools serving a catechetical purpose, or are they serving an evangelistic purpose? Or are they serving some other purpose? Let's leave the other purpose behind. And I think that's largely the question, are they just businesses being run these days? And then ask ourselves, well, within our Catholic identity, are we providing the schooling for Catholic children so that they are raised in the Catholic faith? That used to be, back in the days of the age of mobilisation, in Mannix's day, when we all had a homogenous Catholic society that everybody jumped when Mannix said jump. <laughs> That used to be what our schools were for. They were to serve the children of the parish. The Lutherans long ago realised, not that they're doing it necessarily any better than anybody else, but they long ago realised that they'd be lucky to get 10% Lutheran students at their schools, and all the rest would be everybody else, the great unwashed. And the task is, well, what's your school for? To wash them. <laughs> so it is quite literally if we're talking baptism. So it is a question of rethinking what is the mission of the school. And if, but then there's another possibility, which may be our schools, like they are in places like India or um, uh, you know, or Bangladesh or somewhere or Indonesia, <coughs> Muslim countries. We have Catholic schools there, and the Muslims send their kids there. What are our schools doing there? They are um, being a witness to Christ, even if they can't be, um, you know, pros they can't proselytize in any particular way. Uh, and so, how uh, is our identity? And this is a problem with ecumenism as well. We can't have ecumenical dialogue with one another if we're not very clear what our identity is. A good friend of mine, Father John de Pouch, who was very strongly involved in interfaith dialogue said the important thing is, I come with a clear identity, with something clear to say, and I listen to you who come with a clear identity and something to say. But if we don't have that clear identity and we don't have a clear message, it's all just mushy and doesn't double it. Yeah. Just, if you don't mind, let me just add. Thank you for the answer. Uh, my question is, uh, I don't know if it's the answer. <laughs> She sees it in an ecumenical sense. In right, fact, yeah. You know, a school is the community. No question about it. The problem that sometimes can come in there then, and that's the one for the bigger general probably, um, is there's that other view, which of course is coming from a higher mm. level of things, which are all coming from a traditional level of things, which is saying, oh, no, 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 you know, Hang on a bit, that's, that's quite, not quite what we want to do. So. We just have to ask ourselves why, as Catholics, are we involved in schools? Why are we involved in hospitals? This is a question, it's a new society we're in. There are the changes we've been talking about are deep in our society, but we're still doing things that we were doing years, years back in Daniel Maddox's time, in the, in, that, in the age before 1968. And we haven't really properly asked what do these things mean. You know, it might be a... I'll just give it a little example. St. Philip's School at Blackburn North, they had questions being raised about the continuity of their school. Well, they've used their imagination and said, we're going to reimagine what our school is. And we're going to think about offering a classical curriculum at the primary school level, something which is as rare as hen's teeth. That, any, but that people, whether they're Catholics or not, might like to send their children to, to get a different kind of education. Can our schools give something, not just be what the state school is, but be something different? 
And then the question is, well, what's the difference that you want to be? Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay. I would like to introduce uh, my deputy, Brother Glenn Morris, to uh, say a word of thank you. How interesting was that? Very, very good. I thought it was wonderful. David invited us to ask questions as we went along. <laughs> but I just kept talking, sorry. <laughs> well, the flow of information was so good, it had us all captivated. You all agree? Yeah. 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 So, there's a lot to be encouraged. And some of the take home messages I took were the alien is close to you, not just close, but in the pew right next door to you. We are encouraged to unity through baptism. You made mention of how we are united in the Ukraine, but similarly, here we are united in social values and moral values. Now I'd like to thank David, it was very interesting. A lot of good take home messages. And as a small token of appreciation. Oh, I like small tokens. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would love to stay for the rest of the program today, but I've got a PhD that needs writing and classes to teach in the morning. So, thank you. Thank you.